Well, we've made it all the way to Revelation 18, which uh, focuses on what some would call commercial Babylon. In other words, the what Babylon's influence has been down through history. And so uh, we're in that section, the major section that deals with the tribulation, chap verses four, chapters 4 through 19, which is the bulk of the book of Revelation, as you can see. And uh, we've seen that Bab Babylon began a couple of hundred years after the flood. And what you have is they become, in essence, the leaders or the head of the kingdom of man, if you will, the opposition to God. And so they have a history beginning a couple hundred years after the flood, which led to the dispersion of the languages, etc. And uh, also, I, I believe that there was also the, the breakup of the continents, etc., uh, as well, uh, says of Peleg, which his name means division there in Genesis 10, says, for in his days was the earth divided. And uh, so it came at the same time as the Tower of Babel, so that God separated people because when, ma when unbelievers get together, they tend to want to rebel against God corporately. And so it's like you had the fall all over again after the flood, but this time it was a, the corporate fall of man nationally because God had, after the flood, established nations, which he did not establish before the flood, and therefore that uh, became an institution that we see so important, the book of Revelation before it gets to the second coming in Revelation 20, spends two whole chapters talking about Babylon and her legacy. And so you can see this. She's played an important role. Twice in the history, Babylon has been the largest city in the world. And you see it in the book of Daniel, for example, and other times even before that. So the literary context is this chapter is the second part of the larger unit of chapter 17.1, through 1910. So that is a section, so to speak, uh, portraying God's judgment on Babylon. In chapter 17, John saw Babylon as a great harlot riding the beast, in other words, unfaithful, and together dominating the world. But then devastated in the end when God causes their uh, alliance to fall apart uh, in chapter 18, the effects of that judgment are recorded, and her destruction that was previewed in 14.8, Fallen, Fallen is Babylon the Great, is presented now in its full effects, not by viewing the act of devastation itself, but by hearing a series of dramatic lamentations uttered by those who previously benefited from her evil ways. God's justice in judging Babylon will be celebrated in heaven in the final part of Revelation 19, 1 through 10. So that original statement, Fallen, Fallen is Babylon the Great, was three and a half years before she fell. And this is not unusual, as we say in the book of Revelation, that something is declared to be so before it happens, and then it happens. And so the main idea is all who benefit from Babylon's rich luxuries and idolatry will be the end, will in the end be well her downfall when God judges here and vindicates those she has persecuted. And uh, seems like we're seeing some of that persecution rise up again, even in our own day, coming from Babylon type mentality. So, the structure of the passage, different schemes have been suggested for structure in the content of chapter 18 partly because it is difficult to sort out the different speakers and actors on the three explicit introductions of heavenly actors or speakers that John provides in verses 1, 4, and 21. The first and last sections are relatively brief, giving a heavenly announcement of Babylon's fall and a dramatic enactment of her judgment with accompanying pronouncements in verses 21 through 24. 
the middle section is the longest and most divisive in verses 4 through 20, but in summary, its address is God's people. Uh, it records a lamentation over Babylon's fall by three groups who benefited from her rule on the earth and issues a final call for heaven and earth to rejoice over her demise. Now, this is something, uh, this rejoicing that we'll see at the end of the chapter is something that throws a lot of Christians, you know, that we're rejoicing over judgment. But this is the final, final judgment here. And the sides have been picked. And we live in a day where I don't think we should rejoice in those, those ways because you never know who will become a believer at the end of the day. And so, but here as you're seeing history being resolved and evil being judged, finally we can rejoice because that is one, we always think of the love of God. But the justice of God is also going to be in display here. God finally unleashes his judgment, and that is an aspect of God that we should also realize in harmony with God's love. And so uh, both are aspects. So Revelation 18.1, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. And so uh, th this is in preparation for this chapter is re relative, it's being revealed in relation to this angel who has great brightness. And this uh, is a representative of God, someone with great light brightness as opposed to the darkness of, of the world. Although chapters 17 and 18 are closely related under the theme previewed in 16, 19, in other words, and it says, And Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of wine and fierce wrath. <clears throat> As God's judgment on Babylon, the phrase, After these things I saw, signals a transition to a new segment of that theme. And in this vision, John sees a glorious and mighty angel, different from the interpreting angel, which is seen in the seven bold angels who guided him in chapter 17. Here the angel descends from heaven to proclaim the effects of Babylon's judgment by God. So this impressive angel possesses great authority and glory that lights up the earth, reinforcing the credibility of his proclamation. You know, I think these are literally going to happen. It's literally going to light up. the. All this stuff, I think, is pretty literal. A lot of people don't think it's literal because they don't take the book of Revelation very literal, but this is literally going to happen, an, an, an announcement like this. And in verse 2 we see, and he cried out with a mighty voice. So I don't know if this is going to be something heard globally or what, but nevertheless, uh, <clears throat> apparently he's going to have a real good set of lungs, saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And as we say, that's talking about the world system, the, the, the world, the flesh, the devil, all those influences that Babylon is the leader of. Just as Israel is God's nation, so Babylon is Satan's nation. And we're not saying that individuals don't get saved out of Babylon. They certainly do. But we're talking about uh, this being a nation uh, that personifies evil. And she has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. Sure glad they got those birds in there. <laughs> and so this is a, a picture of, you know, a very evil setup here. The glorious angel moves directly into the main point of the chapter by declaring the fall of Babylon. Uh, for all to hear. He cried out with a mighty voice, with a focus on the effects of her collapse rather than the process or event itself. So uh, the chapter as a whole consists of a series of voices either rejoicing or lamenting over Babylon's resulting devastation and reflecting on why this came upon her. So the announcement of the fall of Babylon is drawn from Isaiah 21 9 which says now behold here comes a troop of riders horsemen in pairs 
And one answered and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, and all the images of her gods are shattered on the ground. So here you see a focus on their re rebellious religious aspect. According to Old Testament imagery, when a city is completely destroyed, it is no longer suitable for human habitation, but will become occupied by savage creatures and evil spirits. And this is how completely she will be destroyed. In other words, which hasn't happened yet. And I would say the majority of evangelical ter interpreters today think Babylon, all these prophecies about were fulfilled uh, when the Babylon was destroyed uh, before the time of Christ. But as I've said, there are over 250,000 people living in the uh, boundaries of what was ancient Babylon today. So I don't think I, it's one of the reasons I believe it's future. So plus, there wouldn't be such a focus on this in relation to the second coming, but right before the second coming, if Babylon had already been fulfilled, you see, in my opinion. For Verse 3 says, For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality. So all the people, all the leaders, He's talking about, you know, within the world with her and the merchants. Those are those three, the three aspects that are focused on in the judgment. The merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. You know, there's a lot of talk today about, you know, uh, how uh, a certain small group of people are these billionaires and own, what, 40, 60 percent of the Earth's wealth even today. And uh, I'm sure that is within the framework and spirit of Babylon, you see what I'm saying, uh, of this accumulation of wealth. Verse 3 explains why Babylon deserves such a horrible judgment. It is because her prostitution with the kings of the Earth and luxurious immorality with the merchants of the Earth. Or she makes deals with the devil, yeah, I guess you could say. Uh, it is both political and economic, the passionate, uh, but it's ultimately religious, you see. In other words, it's ultimately which impacts their um, economic and uh, other areas. Uh, the passionate luxury and materialism of the great city have intoxicated all the nations, the kings of the earth, and the merchants of the earth, which encompass the entire population of the earth, is under her influence. Not all the individuals, but all the nation states, etc. The city has promoted herself by instilling an unquestioning faith in her supposedly inexhaustible resources thereby discouraging any sense of a deeper need for God. See, Babylon and the world attempts to meet all your needs. And that longing that people still have, they ignore, or write off. They're, that God-shaped vacuum, as some have said over the years, is ignored uh, because they can't fill that. And that's why... Uh, some people are drunk all the time because they can't stand being sober, you see, or whatever it is, using drugs or other things to satiate things. And so Babylon, ultimately, even though she can provide great wealth and other things, cannot meet man's deepest need, and that is to have a relationship with God. Uh, the connection of fornication and luxury in this verse indicates that Babylon's fornication consists not only of idolatry, but also includes her pride in excessive, excessive wealth. Uh, false religion often has gone hand in hand with the accumulation and abusive use of luxury. We even have the, in evangelicalism, the health and wealth gospel, right? But then you see this being talked about in Zechariah chapter 5. And let's look at that for a moment. It says, Then the angel who was speaking with me 
went out and said to me, lift up, your, lift up now your eyes and see what this is going forth. And I said, what is it? And he said, this is the EPA going forth. That's a measurement, uh, like a basket, a bushel basket type thing. Again, he said, this is their appearance in all the land. And behold, a lead cover was lifted up. And this is a woman sitting inside the EPA, the bushel basket. And he said, this is wickedness. And he threw her down into the middle of the EPA and cast the lead weight on its opening. So that's some kind of picture here, a restraint against the influence of the woman here. And it goes on and says, Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and there were two women were coming out with the wind in their wings, and they had wings like the wings of a stork. And I, I guess that means a long-range type, you know, big wings type thing. And, and the wings, uh, and they lifted up the epa between the earth and the heavens, and I saw... And I said to the angel who was speaking with me, where are they t uh, taking the epa? In other words, that source of this woman who's in the basket. Then he said to me, to build a temple for her in the land of Shinar. And when it is prepared, she will be set there on her own pedestal. And so it's, it, it's, it's locating the source of this evil influence in Babylon. That is the center. And as I've said, I believe Babylon will be rebuilt and become this powerful center by the midpoint of the tribulation is when it, when it has to be there. Uh, and this is, I think, what it's talking about. In verse 4 of chapter 18, it says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. And apparently there's going to be a separation of believers out of Babylon at this point in the future. That you may not participate in her sins and that you may not receive of her plagues. So I, I take it this is a call of the gospel, you know, for people to come out. So an angel issues an urgent call. This is a call to leave a literal city, but beyond that, it is also a call to shun the enticements represented by the system of which that city is the embodiment. It is called to leave the enticements of idolatry, self-sufficiency, reliance on luxury, and violence against human life. The people are primarily those alive at the height of the beast's kingdom, and the yet-to-come climax of the Babylonian system. So I think that this call to come out probably occurs, well, at some point in the second half of the tribulation or even at the middle of the tribulation uh, for them to come, literally come out. So the, per, uh, the precondition is not against having fellowship with the punishments of Babylon's sin, but against having fellowship and participating with the sins himself. The call for God's people to come out from her reminds us of God's call for Lot to come out of Sodom before judgment, you see. And it says, Wander away from the midst of Babylon and go forth from the land of the Chaldeans. Be also like male goats at the head of a flock, or be a leader. For behold, and this is out of Jeremiah 50, verses 8 and 9, I'm going to arouse and bring up against Babylon a horde of great nations from the land to the, of the north, and they will draw up their battle lines against her. From there, she will be taken captive. Their arrows will be like an expert warrior who does not return empty-handed. So that is in the context of the future judgment of Babylon that we're going to see in the second half. I'm going to flee from the midst of Babylon. Here's another passage. And each of you save his life. Do not be destroyed in her punishment, for this is the Lord's time of vengeance. And this is Jeremiah 51, 6 through 8. He is going to render recompense to her. 
Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord, intoxicating all the earth. Uh, and that, that may bother some people that God is viewed as doing this, but God's sovereign. Mm -hmm. And we see in Romans 1 where he says he gives people over to their sin. He greases a slide, so to speak. So if you want to do that, great. And apparently a similar type dynamic is being talked about here in this passage. Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord, intoxicating all the earth. The nations have drunk of her wine. Therefore, the nations are going mad. You're, you're, you're in a drunken state here, and you're acting crazy. Uh, suddenly, Babylon has fallen and been broken well over her. He's talking to the, the unbelievers here. Bring balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. And that's, a, that's sarcastic. She's, you know, she can't heal herself. You see? So, Jeremiah 51, 45 says, Come forth from her midst, my people, and each of you save yourselves from the fierce anger of the Lord. Talking about that future time and the tribulation, calling believers to come out of Babylon. In Jeremiah 51, 47 through 48, a lot of, a lot of these passages, and these are only part of those that literally relate to what Revelation 18 is talking about, I believe. So it says, Therefore, behold, days are coming when I shall punish the idols of Babylon, and her whole land will be put to shame, and all her slain will fall in her midst. Then heaven and earth and all that is in them will shout for joy over Babylon. So that's going to be reflected here at the end of chapter 18 here as you see that. Uh, for the destroyers will come to her from the north, declares the Lord. Uh, so he's talking about the human uh, armies or whatever that will come uh, to Babylon. And verse 5 in Revelation 18 says, For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So this is a play off the Tower of Babel. In other words, they wanted to have a tower, the book of Genesis says, that reaches into the heavens. Instead, what do they get? They get her sins, her rebellion against God, that reaches heaven. And, and that's why God's responding, you see, at this point in the tribulation. It's finally time for God to right the wrongs and to judge. No, they're future. I don't believe there is such a thing as double fulfillment in the Bible. No, they were not. They're future. Because it's talking, that's been my whole emphasis. It's talking about a future time when Babylon ultimately is going to be destroyed. Now, I do, I do think there are passages, for example, uh, that talk about uh, Israel for, uh, when they start doing this, 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 God's going to judge them, and you have multiple occasions where judgment comes. But I don't believe there are, and a lot of people, as you know, in evangelicalism believe there are passages that have a double fulfillment. Uh, one illustration of that is, who's that guy out of, New Jersey, New York, and he took, wrote a whole book that sold over a million, you know, of uh, some passage out of Isaiah, uh, and he believed it was fulfilled in the past, but it was fulfilled in the Twin Towers also. So that's a double fulfilled twice, you see. That's just crazy to, to think uh, you know, I, uh, long before he attempt, he did that, I've always believed um, from seminary on that there's no such thing as double fulfillment, you see, because there, there's only a single fulfillment because people then try to use that to uh, see fulfillments that are not really there. And that, I think, undermines the precision of the Bible of its prophecies and intent. So this, 
these that we just read in Isaiah in Jeremiah are all f intended to be future fulfillments even to our day. Our own day. They, they weren't fulfilled in the past. But there are passages about Babylon that were fulfilled in the past. And you can discern those from reading them in the context. So her sins have piled up as high as heaven. Once again, this is somewhat sarcastic. Uh, and God has remembered her iniquities. So the statement is a play on the Tower of Babel, just as at the beginning of uh, humanity's corporate rebellion after the flood via the actual Tower of Babel, what actually reaches into the heavens is the accumulation of her sin, not insulating herself from, the flood, from another flood, from God's judgment, which is the apparent attempt in the Tower of Babel that God judges. So, verse 6 says, Pay her back, Babylon, even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her. So, in other words, the cup is viewed as uh, being what she drinks, the elixir, so to speak, uh, that results in the sin that she's involved in. So God said, well, make it twice as strong. This doesn't mean she's going to get paid back twice as much, but it's going to be very, a very, very strong judgment when it comes. So God alone can implement the law of retaliation. It appears that particular reference in this case is to the persecutions and martyrdom of the saints by Babylon rather than to the corruption of the nations at this point in this context. And it was found, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and all who had been slain on the earth. Revelation 18, 4. So then we see, as I've mentioned, that we'll be looking at later, uh, hallelujah. So this is at the beginning of Re Revelation chapter 19. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. So it's mentioned at the end of chapter 18, her destruction. And so this is part of the rejoicing that goes on in heaven here in chapter 19. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality. In other words, her influence, the worldliness, love not the world. Neither th See, that is what's being talked about here. And he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And she, her influence leads to martyrdom of, and persecution of Christians. And what are we seeing going on increasingly today and appears to be headed even here in the wonderful United States, at a 450-year four, retreat from uh, that, which most nations in the world have, have experienced during that time. America has been different. So this is not a prayer for personal vengeance by the persecuted saints, but a heavenly interpretation of the divine response to cr uh, cruelty committed by wicked persons who have passed the point of no return in their moral choices. The last hour has now struck, and it is too late for repentance. This is a judicial pronouncement against a sinful civilization that has reached the ultimate limit of evil. See, once again, I, I said it a while ago, today, even on, an unbeliever on their deathbed sometimes accepts Christ. So we postpone these kind of imprecatory or judgment prayers in the church age, in my opinion. Now, this is a controversial issue for some uh, because we always are holding out hope that, that even the greatest enemies of the gospel today might get saved, and a few of them have down through history. And uh, so, but during the tribulation, you know, in the midpoint, if you take the mark of the beast, you're done for, it says. See, history is going to be different at that point. And so the sides are going to be clear who's on the large side even before a person reaches death. And therefore, uh, 
that this type of judgment is praised because it's, it's judging evil. So the best way is to identify the executioners as God's enemies whom he uses to execute his vengeance, according to chapter 17, 16, and 17. It is the false Christ and his allies who will destroy Babylon in compliance with the overarching purpose of God. See, that's why they turn against her at some point in the tribulation, you see, and uh, apparently help destroy it. Double has the sense that the punishment should be the exact equivalent of the offense in the same way that a person who uh, looks exactly like someone else is called his double. Got that? Um, and as I say, this is called teleonic justice. Punishment fits a crime. And this is always the type of judgment or justice that God implements in Scripture. Uh, the guideline in meeting out the exact equivalence is according to her works. So the cup is the same one mentioned earlier in Revelation uh, 14, 8, verse 10, 14, 17, 4, and 18, 3. Uh, the, the vessel Babylon uses to seduce others has now become the instrument of her own punishment. And, and the cup, once again, is the means that she has used to uh, influence the world. And now that's going to be turned upon her. And verse 8 says, And another angel, a second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Immorality is unfaithfulness to God, uh, and, and is what he's talking about here. So we see in verse 7 it says, uh, To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensually, See, that's the lifestyle that follows from this kind of self-esteem. I noticed our pastor mentioned that this morning uh, <clears throat> and stuff. And I remember when that started becoming popular. And uh, I was good friends with Dave Hunt. And uh, he, uh, you know, spoke out a lot against this crazy idea of self-esteem, you see. That, that, you know, has become... Uh, the, the world's motivation for students in school and all this kind of thing. They have to have self-esteem. If they have good self-esteem, then they'll do well. Well, the Bible doesn't say that at all. Uh, and I'll never forget, we were at Booksellers one year, I think it was in Atlanta, and uh, my youngest son, who's a pastor now in Illinois, he was only like seven or eight, and Dave Hunt had this little thing he would do about, uh, you know, some girl would say, oh, I just hate myself. I'm so ugly and all of this. And Dave would say, well, if you really hated yourself, you'd be glad you were ugly. <laughs> and, you know, that makes sense. <laughs> and, and that's the whole point. People don't really hate themselves in the sense that they say. So our little David, was he in first grade? Yes, and he was uh, in the back of the room with this little girl, and she got a bad grade on her thing, and, and David said, well, and she said, I hate myself, and he said, well, if you hated yourself, you'd be glad you got a bad grade, and she started crying, and I think David got his only spanking in school, something, isn't that right, Janice? Something like that. He didn't get a spanking. Okay, that was another kid. But he, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, <clears throat> see, he was in first grade. <laughs> but I got off on this. this is, you know, I got off on this. <laughs> so, uh, to the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensually, to the same degree her torment and mourning, for she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I am not a widow and will never see mourning. She's saying, in essence, I'm living in rebellion against God and look at all the wonderful things and blessings that I have. You see, we don't need God, do we? 
That's that's what she's saying. That's what so many people in the world think. So we see in this verse the insight into four reasons why judgment is necessary. Number one, Babylon's sin is self-glorification. It's self-esteem. Secondly, see, self-esteem when, when, cuts you off from recognizing your sin. Secondly, Babylon's satisfaction and luxury. In other words, it seeks the things of this world. Some people have luxury, that's fine. That, that, it's not bad in and of itself, is it? It's when that is your focus becomes the thing that you rely on in place of God. That's what's bad. Thirdly, Babylon's haughty self-confidence is what, you know, I'm never going to be judged, she's saying in essence. I'm going to get away with it. There, there's no real God out there that's going to hold me and fourthly, Babylon's avoidance of suffering. In other words, she uses all these things to avoid suffering. And, of course, that's why judgment's on the verge of coming here in, in this context here. So, for this reason in verse 8, in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire for the Lord God uh, who judges her is strong. See, God at the end of something, you know, flood, the flood, you know, if your house is flooded, you can recover from it, fix it up. If your house burns down, you got to start all over. You see the logic? The flood was an interim judgment in history. At the end, what's going to happen? You're going to burn it all down. This present heaven and earth is going to be destroyed. He's going to have a whole new creation because this present heaven and earth is tainted with sin. And so at some point after the millennium, you know, he's going to, I, there's a controversy. Some people think he's just going to renew uh, this heaven and earth. I think he's going to totally destroy it and have a totally brand new creation. And, you know, there's two, di two different Greek words for new. Neo means to renew. And what's the other one? What? Yes, kainos is the word that's used for the new heavens and new earth, which means brand new, generally. Although there's some overlap, you know, the two words, generally speaking. Yeah, and, and she'll be burned up with fire for the Lord, God who judges her is strong. So because of the four reasons given in verse 7 that we just looked at, three plagues will happen suddenly to Babylon. Number one, pestilence. Pestilence will, if you can't get rid of it, will really uh, affect your quality of life, so to speak. <laughs> Mourning. In other words, she, she's all upset over the judgments that are happening here, you see. And, uh, you know, thirdly, famine. There's all of these material things that she took pleasure in are going to be gone. You know, the Bible says God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. And sometimes when bad things happen to bad people, we think, oh, well, they're getting their due. Well, not really, because sometimes bad things happen to good people, you see. So we can't, we should not, current in this age, uh, judge people according to those things. We don't really know. Someone you disagree with dies early in life or something. Oh, well, they had their comeuppance. But we, you don't know that. You don't know why they went, because so many righteous, wonderful people have died early in their life as well. Even though generally people who are, who are godly live longer on average. You know, you're not dying from drug overdose or anything. So, the phrase's forward position in its clause emphasizes how quickly Babylon will experience what she sought to avoid through her luxury death, mourning, and famine. She thinks she's getting away with it. Babylon is called the great city in verse 10. 
which is no match for God as noted in verse 8. The Lord's strength is the ground for the suddenness and severity of the judgment to come up on Babylon. It's going to be sudden. Uh, this passage is related to Jeremiah 50, verses 33 through 40, and we see its fulfillment in Revelation 18. So that's another one of those Old Testament passages. I didn't take the time to quote a long seven or eight verses here to quote that, but it's a fulfillment of what is spoken of in Jeremiah. So in verse 9 it says, And the kings of the earth who committed act of immorality, these are the leaders of the earth, and, and lived sensually with her, will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning. Or they're not sad because uh, they regret anything. The only thing is they regret the loss of the system that they've been involved in, you see. So after completing his call for God's people to remove themselves from Babylon, the revealing angel describes the laments of the kings of the earth in verses 9 and 10, the merchants in verses 11 through 13 and 15 through 17a, the sea people, in other words, the people from around the world uh, who are involved in trade, mercantiles, mercantile system, in verses 17b through 19, the kings sob openly and regret having lost their power so suddenly. And they realize that Babylon's doom is inevitable. Apparently sharing in Babylon's luxury is a part of committing fornication with her. See, so, so their power is based on, the, on this worldliness rather than on God. Uh, now, we have, even today, many godly leaders and businessmen and people like that. But th this is, during the tribulation, the rapture will <laughs> remove uh, all those godly believers, you see. And, and the, the system that's being talked about here uh, will be totally controlled, apparently, at this time. That's why believers are going to need the mark of the beast in order just to eat in the second half of tribulation. So in verse 10 it says, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, these are the lamenters saying, woe, woe, the great city Babylon, this, this uh, strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Now, a few verses earlier it says in one day, and now it narrows it down to one hour. I take those literally. Uh, I mean, if God's going to burn this thing up, it's not going to be hard for him to do it in an hour, is it? wonder how long it took to burn up Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm talking about for the judgment to come. Sure, there was burning and smoldering after that, but he's saying it's going to happen quickly, suddenly, unexpectedly. So the rest of the kings of the world are careful to distance themselves from the grim sight as they witness Babylon's turning. They are helpless to do anything to help the city and are probably afraid that the same will happen to them. And this demonstrates that the burning of Babylon is not the ultimate end of history. Uh, uh, the use of the word woe, woe, are an exclamation of sorrow. The doubling of the woe expresses the de a depth of their sorrow, the depth of their sorrow, occasioned by the suddenness of Babylon's fall and the emptiness of life without her. See, it's these kind of things that, that they believed they were getting meaning and purpose from. The illusion was that Babylon could defy God, martyr his saints, and get away with it. The world thinks that today. They think they're getting away with things. You know, they stole that election. They, and whether whether we overturn it or not, probably not, because of the further corruption. Uh, they believe they're getting away with it. It was worth it for them to have power and take it away from someone else that they didn't agree with. And, uh, man, what a setup for the tribulation. If the rapture happens pretty soon, what a setup for America. 
The illusion was that Babylon could defy God, martyr his saints, and get away with it. But now that misconception has disappeared. Calling her the strong city is likely a sarcastic reaction. In one, who's strong versus God? No one. And, and this, is, this is why unbelievers gang up against believers, isn't it? In uh, one hour indicates the suddenness of judgment on the harlot. The notion of immediate demise comes from Jeremiah 51, 8. Suddenly Babylon has fallen and been broken well over her. See, it's the same thing you see going on there in Revelation. Bring balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. More sarcasm there. Ain't, ain't going to happen. You can't send her to the emergency room and her overcome this. It ain't going to happen. So, Babylon's great legacy throughout history is going to come to a sudden end because God's going to finally intervene directly, as we've been talking about in history, and destroy her. And verse 11 says, And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. So it's going to have a real effect on uh, global commerce here, you see. It's interesting. You know, we have, as you see in this picture, you know, we have these cargo ships. And that's kind of become uh, the symbol of global trade, that and oil tankers and things like that. And... Uh, they're going to mourn and weep because no one buys their cargoes anymore. So the merchants take up their dirge in verse 11 because no one buys their merchandise any longer. Primarily, they demoan the loss of profits and customers. But they also grieve over the disappearance of so great a treasure as this city represents and, and this whole system that they're involved in. In other words, he strikes it at the center of it. The dirge uh, centers on trade because the wealth it generates is generally associated with a sense of false security that keeps people from seeing, uh, seeing greed, cruelty, injustice, etc. in their true light. So, and now it describes the cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of... Uh, citron wood and every article of ivory and every article made from very costly wood the bronze iron and marble there's these are the, the the things that people use to create nice things in the world that they ship and he goes on in cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and cargoes of horses and chariots and slaves and human life. So it ends with it. Slaves are part of this. Understand, slavery in the world is at an all-time high in our own day. So the range of items include ornaments, apparel, furniture, perfumes for personal and religious use, food, social requirements. The article divides itself into seven categories. And here they are, the precious wares, gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls. Secondly, materials of rich attire, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet. Thirdly, materials for costly furniture, all scented wood, every vessel of ivory or most precious wood, brass, iron, and marble. Fourthly, precious spices like cinnamon, spice, incense, ointment, and frankincense. Fifthly, articles of food like wine, oil, fine flour, wheat. Those are things that the rich people use. Sixth, merchandise for agricultural and domestic use. Cattle, sheep, horses, chariots. Seven, traffic in men, bodies, the souls of men. They think that they could even buy and sell people. So, and the fruit you long for has gone from you, and all things that were luxurious and splendid 
have passed away from you, and men will no longer find them. So these niceties that give meaning to life for, um, for the world are gone. Though the speakers are unidentified, they are most likely the merchants mentioned earlier in the passage. The term fruit means ripe autumn fruit, which is a deeply desired fruit in the cause of great anguish. So the supply line for all these luxury items have been destroyed, which impacts the life of the wealthy of the world. And so, as I've been talking about, there's the parallels between these passages. And you see, compared to the golden cup, and so you can see on the screen, there from Jeremiah 50 and 51, and then how it's uh, referred to in the book of Revelation. See, So the dwelling on many waters, there in Jeremiah 51 and then Revelation 17, 1, involved with nations, uh, Jeremiah 51, 7b, and then Revelation 17, 2, named the same, same name, 51, and then 18, 10, destroyed suddenly, Jeremiah 51, 8, and 18, 8 in Revelation, destroyed by fire, Jeremiah 51, 30, and then 17, 16 in the book of Revelation, never to be inhabited again, Jeremiah 50, 39, and also in Revelation 18, 21. <clears throat> Punished according to her works, Jeremiah 50, 29, and then Revelation 18, 6. Fall il is illustrated. In other words, he talks about it illustratively in Jeremiah 51, 63, and 64, and the same in 18, 21 of Revelation, God's people flee in Jeremiah 51, 6 and verse 45, and then 18, 11 and 18, 4 in Revelation. And finally, heaven rejoices, and so the merchants of these things who become rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning. So, you know, they're at a distance from this. Uh, regretting what is happening. So the enrichment of the merchants derived from their trade with Babylon is the implied reason for their mourning. They distance themselves from the scene of destruction rather than rushing in to try to stop it. However, because they fear the same thing might happen to them, saying, whoa, whoa, there we go again with their woes, <laughs> the great city, she who was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls is what's going on here. The dirge of the merchants combines the harlot image of 17.4 with the city image of chapter 18. The figurative description of the city's clothing and adornment in this dirge is almost the same as that of the harlot who is symbolized in 17.4. The fine linen and gold, jewels, and pearls are part of the wardrobe and adornment of the saints in the holy city later on in 2110, but not the purple and scarlet. These two have associations too close to the beast. So believers are going to end up getting it, right, in the end. And the world's going to lose it, unbelievers. For in one hour, such great wealth has been laid waste, and every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance. Boy, I don't want to get close to that. So the last two-thirds of the verse begins a description of a new set of mourners, the sea people, in other words, a sh which are shipmasters, the, the people sailing the seas, was subordinate to the supreme commander of the ship. Uh, the picture of these sea people closely resembles that of the kings in verse 10 and the merchants in verse 15. They stood at a distance. And they were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like the great city? Man, that was, that was a great run. That, you know, the, the most important city in the world, they believe, is destroyed. 
So the grandeur of the city is once again a cause for awe. The smoke of the city's burning provokes deepest regrets among the sea peoples, the merchants, that is, you know, on those. An association to the question was the one asked in 13.4 is inevitable. Who is like the beast? That, that's what the unbelievers were saying, so God shows them. Uh, the implied answer to the question here is no city. Babylon, that represents all that a city can be in the realm of materialism, is no more. And they threw dust on their heads, and they were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city in which all uh, who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth for her. In one hour, she has been laid waste. So with a symbolic act to express their anxiety, the sea people utter their brief lament. Casting dust on one's head is a symbol for grief throughout the Old Testament. You see Job doing this. And they bewail the loss of the city by which they have become rich. The wealth of Babylon represents great spending power, and so it is a welcome uh, resource for seafarers who use her uh, port. But this will be no more. So this is the, in Zephaniah 2.15, so this is the exalted city which dwells securely, who says in her heart, I am, and there is no one beside me. How she has become a desolation, a resting place for beasts. Everyone who passes by will hiss and wave his hand in contempt. And so we see where it, it, that section ends, and it says, Rejoice over her, O heavens, and you saints and apostles and prophets. The saints, apostles, and prophets are the people who have been killed uh, by uh, Babylon because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. So now we see a switch to heaven in the contrast of responses as verses uh, 9 through 19 have told of the sorrow of three groups over the occurrence of a catastrophe proclaimed in verses 1 through 8. And verse 20 speaks of the exaltation of the faithful over the same event. The same thing that causes deep sorrow on earth brings great jubilation in heaven. The Lord is finally answering the imprecatory prayers of the saints from chapter 6. And so this is from Revelation 6.10, and I tried to play this song before. That's why I'm hurrying to get to this end with this. Uh, from a bunch of hippies from around 1970. <laughs> So, I love that song. It's a six-minute song, and it has this section in it that I think is, is great. So I'm going to end here for tonight. Any questions or comments? There's an individual named Debbie Kerner. Yes? Well, uh, it's it's on the Euphrates River, which has access to the sea. Mm -hmm. 
You know, it's located between chapter after the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments, but I don't know chronologically really where it occurs. But it's obviously toward the end, <laughs> you know, and stuff at some point. <clears throat> but it, it's obviously important enough for uh, the Lord to spend two chapters talking about this, and as I say, it's because it represents the world and the world system that we live in, even today. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Could you speak louder? Well, yeah, no, Babylon is in uh, modern Iraq. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear that last. I, well, yeah, but Babylon is Babylon. It's not Iran. It was on the Euphrates River. You can go there and visit it today. Uh, if you had been here earlier, we've talked about this a lot, about how there are, today there's about a population of about 250,000 people in three villages or cities that live in the boundaries of ancient Babylon. And so many people allegorize these to say it refers to Rome or something like that and not literal Babylon. And I've been making the whole point of that it, it refers to literal Babylon because none of this has yet been fulfilled literally, yes. Uh, well, at one time, no, Babylon is Babylon. I understand. The region was taken over by Persia. The region was taken over by Rome. You see what I'm saying? Uh, the Medo-Persian Medo Empire took over Babylon. You know, that's recorded in the book of Daniel. But Babylon is located about 65 miles south of Baghdad today. <laughs> And during the Gulf War, we had so, a whole unit of soldiers protecting it. And as I've said, uh, my good friend Charlie Dyer went over when Saddam Hussein had two uh, banquets celebrating ancient Babylon. And he'd spent over a billion dollars reconstructing part of Babylon, including they had banquets those two years in the very, on the very foundation where uh, God did the handwriting on the wall in the very, uh, what's that called? Banquet hall that's talked about in the book of Daniel. And so Saddam Hussein's goal was to uh, rebuild Babylon because Babylon was one of the few, uh, the last country that and Rome to militarily defeat Israel. And, and so he, he had posters that my friend Charlie Dyer brought home that were side issues and they had like uh, somebody representing uh, Nebuchadnezzar and then Saddam Hussein's face was right there. And he, that was his goal to defeat Israel, you see. And that was part of the thing. Now he, he was secular. And that's what, probably why they didn't have any problems doing the secular uh, gods and everything in the recreation of this back in uh, the late 80s when this occurred. Yes. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the scriptures and the word of God that 
certainly will be fulfilled literally in history. And we thank you for the book of Revelation that gives us insight into this. And we thank you so much for the fact that you're in control, even though we see in our own country things seem to uh, be uh, moving against believers. And uh, so we ask mainly that because we know the end from the beginning that we be faithful in serving you no matter what happens and uh, trusting you that you will justify uh, your character in history. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.